Damn it. <laughs> ah, let's go. Anyway, I آقا صورتت نیفته دادش صورتت نیفته نه کسی نیفته آقا همهش سابسوری چه درست داره سنگ وی هم دارن که یکان ویژه رو بزنن کلی ماشین زدن تلکون بزن In Iran, tens of thousands have taken to the streets in a massive countrywide uprising. Dozens have been killed and hundreds arrested. Most demonstrations in Iran historically have started in the capital, organized by educated, upper middle class and politically active citizens. The protests then spread outward from there. But the most recent demonstrations started in the east of the country, far from Tehran. They then spread to the rest of the country within days. And they were started by working middle class Iranians without a leader or a set agenda. Can you imagine how hard it is to stop Ronaldo from scoring a goal? I used to play soccer. Let me tell you, it's almost impossible. But the Iranian team just did the impossible. To the Iranian people, I say, you showed courage on the playing field. And today you show the same courage in the streets of Iran. Iran has many problems, air pollution, water scarcity, billions wasted on terror. Can you imagine what would happen if the Iranian government, instead of wasting your money on Syria and Yemen and unnecessary wars in the Middle East, would start investing it in solving these problems in Iran? The solution to all these problems is the Iranian people. That's why I offered medical aid to save Iranian lives after a devastating earthquake. That's why I opened a Farsi telegram group to teach water conservation to Iranian farmers. And that's why I'll never stop advocating for peace with the Iranian people. One day, one day I'll hope to watch Iran's soccer team go head to head against Israel in a free Tehran. On that day, we'll all be winners. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live via Skype with James Jacob Prash, and this is This Week in Prophecy. Blessings of Jesus, dear friends, This Week in Prophecy. As usual, we begin in the Middle East looking at contemporary events as they unfold in the last seven to eight days that are taking place as we speak, and we examine their possible ramifications in light of what is predicted for the last days for Israel and for the church in light of the Word of God. This week in prophecy, again, we focus on Daniel 10 and the place of Iran in the last days as a threat to Israel, as Daniel predicted. The Iranian government has reopened its UF-6 nuclear plant that was closed for nine years. On the orders of Ayatollah Ali Khomeini, the UF-6 plant, which, made, which makes feedstocks or has made feedstock for centrifuges and machines associated with the centrifuges for purposes of uranium enrichment to achieve weapons-grade fissionable material, was reopened in Isfahan after having been closed for a number of years. It's Iran's first major step in restoring its nuclear program since the 2015 accord with Barack Obama, which was characterized by 
a known deception of Iran while Iran was still engaged in sponsoring terror to kill Americans and American allies. Also, while Iran was allowed to operate certain facilities without due inspections unless they were given 30 days notice that an inspection was coming. Now, this was obviously a bogus program, as we talked about before, and it was strategically the common sense thing to do to stop it. Nonetheless, Iran has taken steps to reopen that facility. Khomeini warned that he would give this order if the nuclear deal collapsed after the U.S. walkout. Again, his attempts to intimidate the Europeans, who are also under pressure from corporate and industrial interests who are doing business with Iran. Now, this comes on the heels of the Trump administration warning even allied nations to the United States about engaging in the oil trade with Iran, a warning issued this very week. According to the United Nations International Atomic Energy Agency, however, Iran has also been storing large amounts of yellow cake, yellow cake, again, enriched uranium since the nuclear deal, and has produced some of this domestically. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani says he's instructing his government to be ready to ramp up uranium enrichment after the U.S. pullout from the Iran nuclear deal. Rouhani was on state TV just minutes after President Donald Trump announced the withdrawal. Rouhani called the U.S. unfaithful and said Trump is not to be trusted. He painted the U.S. as non-committal from the beginning of the arrangement. The threat of uranium enrichment hinges on Iran's agreement with the countries that are still in the deal, the U.K., France, Germany, Russia, and China. Rouhani said his country will stay in the deal if Iran's interests are guaranteed, even without the U.S. involved. Rouhani said he'll consult with the remaining countries and wait a few weeks before taking steps to respond. علت کمبود کیک زرد در کشور از سال 88 غیر فعال بود پس از برجام و واردات کیک زرد و نیز افزایش تولید داخلی آن امکان راه اندازی مجدد این کارخانه به وجود آمده به دنبال بد های آمریکا در برجام و دستور رهبر معظم انقلاب و ابلاغ رئیس جمهور مبنی بر آمادگی برای افزایش ظرفیت غنیسازی در چارچوب برجام سازمان انرژی اتمی در مدت دو هفته توانست با انجام تعمیرات و اصلاحات لازم زمینه تحقق این دستور را فراهم کند Now, having the yellow cake is an alarm bell in itself, but the capacity to produce it domestically is more than an alarm bell. It's more like a, at least a six-alarm fire. Things are definitely brewing. To what degree the Iranians are posturing in order to intimidate the Europeans is a question. Nonetheless, it is something both Israel and the United States and the Saudi Arabians and the Emirates are taking very, very seriously. And they are doing so this week in prophecy. Again, watch Daniel chapter 10 and watch these events in light of Daniel 10, the Iranian threat. In the meanwhile, further infiltration has been attempted from Gaza, but this time it is not large crowds or mobs or riots. It is professional terrorists on terrorist missions. Israel has thwarted one such attempt on the 27th of June of three Palestinian Muslim terrorists attempting to enter Israel. The trio fled back across the border in an earlier incident, and unfortunately, the Palestinian Muslims are using their conventional strategy of civilians as human shields. A 15-year-old Palestinian boy trying to break the security fence at the behest of Hamas. They'll put an underage youth in front of the terrorists. Uh, was taken to the Barzlai hospital after he was shot in self-defense by the Israelis. Now, for them to take a 15-year-old boy and use him as a human shield, hoping the Israelis would not shoot them, because they have a human shield and a 15-year-old boy, shows the mentality of these people. The Israelis, of course, have rushed the boy to the hospital. But again, the world will say actually very little about these things.
This Week in Prophecy. Hamas has announced its upgrading for an armed conflict with Israel. Again, some of this may be rhetoric, but there are practical aspects to what they have said and what they're doing. They fired an additional 35 to 45 rockets this week in prophecy. A number of rockets were launched on Wednesday. What they have done is established a new quote-unquote war room um, where various terrorist factions can integrate with Hamas into a centralized command for <clears throat> armored assault columns in a common campaign against Israel. Thus, it is not a Hamas command center, but is a command center where Hamas and other radical groups can work in tandem to attack Israel from Gaza. Now again, Israel withdrew from Gaza unilaterally in the hope for peace. Gaza was only used to launch missiles and now incendiary devices from kites and balloons. Israel has not yet retaliated from the attack on Wednesday night launched by Hamas, but is expected to do so. National Security Advisor of the United States, John Bolton, has met with Vladimir Putin to organize a summit going to take place between the United States and Mr. Putin. High on the agenda will be, undoubtedly, Syria. This has had complicated ramifications both for Russia. This has had complicated ramifications both for Russia and the United States, as well as for Israel and for the Assad regime. Both the United States and Mr. Putin are now on the same page in trying to, for the moment, limit Iran's prospects of operating in Syria. Meanwhile, the Assad government has opened up its own attacks on the Kenitra region against certain other forces. This conflict close to the Israeli border is something we have warned about. The United States is not actively doing anything to help the anti-Assad forces in southern Syria at the moment, close to the Israeli border. Whether this is part of an agreement with Mr. Putin or a temporary agreement until the summit takes place with Mr. Putin cannot be stated. What we are sure of is Israel is watching it very closely and will not allow any Iranian or Iranian-backed positions to be maintained within striking distance of Israel. Mr. Putin has responded. Likewise, by pressuring the Assad regime and directly confronting the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and Hezbollah forces controlled by the Iranian government to curtail their operations in southern Syria and not to provoke Israel. This will be the first full meeting between the two presidents that has ever taken place since the election of Mr. Trump. Uh, it will be held in a third nation, uh, which is yet to be disclosed. But more time is needed for preparation for the agenda. Nonetheless, Iran and Syria will undoubtedly be on the top of the list. Part of the impetus for this meeting is undoubtedly the up to 300 Russian mercenaries who were recruited from the Russian military commandos as civilians that were killed by the United States and United States-backed forces on the banks of the Euphrates two months ago. But it's happening this week in prophecy. This shows what happens. We approach something that broadly or vaguely at least resembles a potential Gog and Magog scenario, and then there's a pulling back from it. Now, eventually, there may be a Gog and Magog scenario. No one denies this, and the elements of it are all there. There may indeed be two battles of Gog and Magog, not just the one at the end of the millennium, 
in the book of Revelation, but another one foreshadowing it. That is my view and the view of many other people. There may be two. But again, we warn against the boys who cry wolf, who say it's always imminent, and they misinterpret any event that resembles it as saying that it's about to take place at any time. Again, this kind of boy who cried wolf scaremongering does more harm than good, and it is not a responsible treatment of the events or a responsible handling of Scripture in examining those events. Right now, Mr. Putin and the United States, together with Israel, all have a vested interest in a degree of cooperation preventing a conflict. That conflict may eventually take place, but right now there is a consensus on curtailing and containing Iranian activities inside Syria, particularly those close to the Israeli border and the Golan. Let us continue this week in prophecy. Prince William, on an official British visit at the behest of the British Foreign Ministry, has said that British-Israeli ties have never been stronger in the first visit of a member of the British royalty to the nation Israel since independence. This begs the question, why has Theresa May and her government been so hostile to Israel and been so accommodating of radical Islamic terror when it comes to Israel? Uh, again, her vote in the United Nations with UNESCO decrying any Israeli claims to the Temple Mount or the Wailing Wall, which she did at the behest of Obama, Barack Obama, and John Kerry. Why? Again, the criticisms of her government on the Israeli handling of the rocket and incendiary device attacks from Gaza setting the forest fires. Why is she focusing on the Israeli response instead of on the provocation? We are going to see more and more of Obadiah 15, as we always say. These nations who fault Israel for standing up to Islamic radicalism and this radical Islamic terror are going to increasingly become the victims of it themselves. You condemn Israel for defending itself from something that is a threat to you. We see this elsewhere in continental Europe, particularly with the left-wing government of Sweden, which calls itself a feminist government. It is essentially a cabinet of left-wing women who don't know anything and who can't do anything. While well, Islamic radical gangs have taken over Malmo and created no-go areas inside Sweden for Swedish citizens, while the amounts of social benefit and violent crimes, including rape, perpetrated against Swedes are carried out by the Muslim community in disproportionate numbers. These same women from this feminist government, when they had their state visit, a delegation in Iran, these great feminists honored fundamentalist Islam by wearing halab just to please these radical Muslims who are supporting terror against more moderate Islamic states and against the West. This is the ugly hypocrisy, the stupidity of the present Swedish government. It is the ugly hypocrisy and the stupidity of the Theresa May government, of the Emmanuel Macron government, and not least of all, certainly the Angela Merkel government. They will continue to reap what they sow. Obadiah 15, watch this space and mark my words. More importantly, mark the word of God. Obadiah verse 15, this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, Mr. Erdogan, as expected, has consolidated his power base in Turkey, despite the increasingly desperate state of the Turkish economy. We warned that this would likely happen. He is playing the game that all dictators play. When they get in trouble domestically, when they get in trouble economically, they look for external enemies. 
and his external enemy, his target of choice, has been the avalanche of verbal hostility launched against Israel. Again, he must set up a straw man, find an external threat, or an imagined one, or invent one, in order to consolidate an artificial sense of national unity in the wake of his failing policies, particularly his economic policies. Yes, Recep Erdogan has consolidated power in the elections in Turkey. Now, this is something that would tend to ferment a longer-term possibility of a Gog and Magog scenario. As we've said multiple times, he's a bad man. He is a dangerous man. But this week in prophecy, his grip has strengthened. This week in prophecy in Iran, however, the opposite seems to be happening. The Iranian currency has reached new lows. It is plummeting radically as the United States continues to block Iran's participation in international currency payments. As additional pressure comes from the United States in opposition to the purchasing of Iranian oil and of Western companies doing business with Iran at the threat of being blocked from doing business with the USA, including the possibility of fines and penalties. Iran is in a bad state of its own merit, purely its own financial mismanagement by the mullahs, these largely uneducated, radical Islamic clerics trying to one, run a war machine and trying to run an economy when they know nothing about economics, are running the currency and the economy to the ground. But now that they have irked Mr. Trump, they are finding it compounded by the economic and political pressures coming from the United States. Iran is in a real, real mess economically. This has triggered protests bordering on riots in a number of Iranian cities this week in prophecy. In some of the protests, we have the protesters in significant numbers chanting loudly in Persian, in Farsi, death to Palestine, death to Palestine. This is amazing, and it shows that there are two Irans. There is the Iran of Kirush, Cyrus the Great, the ancient friend of Israel. And there is the Iran of the Mullahs. Again, we look at the book of Daniel, chapter 10. What did Daniel see? He saw the prince of Persia fighting. There is a demonic power over Iran battling against the angels of the Lord particularly Michael. That's happening right now. What Daniel saw is happening now. There is a battle in the heavenlies, the principalities controlling Iran against the angels of God, fighting over the destiny of Israel. Iran, of course, has been on the war path against its Christians for some time, particularly evangelicals which has not, of course, stopped anti-Israel activist Stephen Sizer from going to Iran with his usual backslapping and photo ops, with the regime actively engaged in not only supporting terror, but persecuting Christians and hanging evangelical pastors. It's a delight to be with you today. Thank you for the invitation to contribute to this important conference. Uh, why has Israel been the subject of more United Nations resolutions than any other country in the world? And why has the United States vetoed virtually every single one of them? 60% of UN resolutions have been critical of Israel or its interests. Um, why is there such a close relationship between the United States and Israel? Why so much of a fascination with Israel among uh, evangelical Christians in particular? 
It's important to understand that the, um, that, uh, the Christian Zionist lobby is 10 times larger than the Jewish Zionist lobby. Surveys in America, the Pew Research Forum says that uh, one in four American Christians regard it as their biblical responsibility to support Israel. And among evangelical Christians, that uh, rises to over 60%. Christian Zionism is uh, a, a movement that goes back at least uh, 200 years, but it has uh, become very influential in our generation as a result of the founding of the State of Israel and the 1967 war, which was seen as, in some sense, the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, the Bible coming true. And uh, in 1976, we had the election of a born-again evangelical president, Jimmy Carter. 1977, the election of Menachem Begin as the Israeli prime minister. And a marriage uh, uh, develops between the evangelical right and the Israeli right. And it's brokered by Jerry Falwell, who for 50 years becomes the leading advocate for Israel in the United States. He could boast of having access to 100 million American Christians on a weekly basis. And when, uh, when Jerry Falwell died, he, the uh, mantle was taken up by John Hagee. John Hagee is the leader of the Christians United for Israel, and he reflects uh, the broad coalition of Christian organizations in America and uh, in Europe that see their mandate or responsibility to defend or to support or advocate for uh, Zionism in uh, America today. I'll just give you a couple of examples of uh, statements by John Hagee. He said, the sleeping giant of Christian Zionism has awakened. There are 50 million Christians standing up and applauding Israel. Uh, in uh, 2007, at the founding of Kufi, in the presence of U.S. senators and after a, a recorded message from the U.S. president, uh, John Hagee said this, It is 1938, Iran is Germany, Ahmadinejad is the new Hitler. We must stop Iran's nuclear threat and stand boldly with Israel, the early democracy in the Middle East. Think of our potential future together. 50 million evangelicals joining in common cause with 5 million Jewish people in America. It is a match made in heaven. The political agenda of Christian Zionism is sixfold. The first element of their theology that has a political, uh, 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 a political consequence is because they believe the Jews are the chosen people, uh, they feel it is their biblical and uh, moral responsibility to defend Israel, to lobby for Israel in Congress and the Senate and the White House. And they do that very effectively. Alongside APAC, you have numerous Christian organizations that lobby every single U.S. politician. It's the reason you won't find uh, a single U.S. congressman critical of Israel in office, because it's political suicide. Uh, Bridges for Peace, Christians United for Israel, the International Christian Embassy, Christian Friends of Israel. There are over 200 Christian Zionist organizations in America today. So the first element of their uh, politi political agenda is to support Israel uh, in, uh, in Washington. Secondly, because they believe that God gave the land of Israel to the Jewish people exclusively, you find Christian organizations campaigning for the settlement program to be expanded. Uh, and so you have uh, Christians, uh, the Christian Friends of Israeli Communities will link churches with settlements, funding the settlements, campaigning for the settlements, uh, supporting the settlement program. The third element of their uh, strategy is the belief that Jerusalem is their eternal capital. So what is their agenda there? Well, how do you get the world to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel? It's very easy. You move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And if the Americans move their embassy, everyone else has to do the same. And de facto, Jerusalem becomes the capital of Israel. And so Christian organizations campaigning to move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. The funding has been allocated. The, uh, the building has been identified. And the legislation has been approved on three occasions. 
but successive US presidents have refused to sign off on the legislation. So it's a matter of when, not whether. The fourth element of their theology is very controversial, and that is that they believe the temple, the Jewish temple, must be rebuilt before the Messiah comes. The problem is the Haram al-Sharif, the Dome of the Rock, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the mosque is in the, in the way of where the Jewish temple must be rebuilt. And so you find Christian organizations campaigning to destroy the Dome of the Rock, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, in order to rebuild the Jewish temple. And members of the far right uh, uh, Israeli organizations committed to doing that, Gershon Salomon, the Temple Mount Faithful, they are guests of honor in many churches uh, in the United States. He said this recently, he said, we must have a war, uh, we must bring the Messiah by fighting. Uh, we must uh, bring the Messiah by fighting on his behalf. Uh, we must have a war, he says. And that leads me to their final element, which is that their theology is very apocalyptic. It is confrontational. Uh, it is uh, deeply skeptical of the peace process. And it is uh, a polarized view of the world, a very pessimistic, apoc apocalyptic view of the world. Deeply destructive. And that is, I'm suggesting to you, one of the primary reasons why uh, US politicians, European politicians, are so aligned to Israel against the interests of Iran, uh, the Palestinians, and the wider Middle East. In 2006, I helped to write a statement that was endorsed and signed by the heads of the churches in Jerusalem, repudiating Christian Zionism unequivocally, unconditionally, as heretical, as a, a, a repudiation of Christian theology. This was part of the statement which the heads of the churches in Jerusalem uh, signed. We reject the contemporary alliance of Christian Zionism and organizations uh, with the Israeli government that presently impose their unilateral preemptive borders and domination over Palestine. We reject the Christian Zionism that facilitates these policies that advances racial exclusivity and perpetual war rather than the gospel of universal love, redemption, and peace. We condemn, they condemn the world to the doom of Armageddon. We call upon everyone to liberate themselves from ideologies of militarism and occupation, but to pursue the healing of the nations. So I want to emphasize, and I do this in my books, Christian Zionism, which is available in Arabic, and uh, Zionist Christian Soldiers, which is available in Arabic and a number of other languages, and uh, two films which I recommend with God on our side, and uh, a number of uh, videos which I've made on Christian Zionism, which are available today, to emphasize to our Muslim and Christian brothers in the Middle East and Jewish friends that Christian Zionism is a heresy, that it is a, a travesty and a distortion of the Christian message. It is true that Christians are called to jihad. There is a biblical, um, a biblical emphasis on jihad in the teaching of Jesus. A holy war, a struggle, but it is not against other peoples. It is an internal struggle. It is a spiritual struggle against evil that runs through the heart of each one of us, not through nations, not through religions. So it's important to emphasize that jihad, in a Christian sense, is a spiritual war, that our enemy is Satan, our enemy are the demonic forces in the heavenly realms, not nation states, not political systems, and certainly not other religions. The Apostle Paul says in the letter to the Ephesians, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the, dark, uh, the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil. So we must resist the temptation to think that another race, another religion are our enemy. We're all created in the image and likeness of God. And Jesus calls his followers at least to be peacemakers, to love our enemies, to, um, to resist evil non-violently. He calls us to repudiate the use of violence to justify uh, our calling to follow him. So in a Christian sense, jihad is a radical 
uh, strategy, but it is not about conquest or about conflict. It is about compassion, mercy, mediation, and peacemaking. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Let us pursue the path of peace so that we too can earn the right to be called children of God. Thank you and God bless you. As long as you hate Israel, you're a friend of Stephen Sizer. That's what the message comes across as being. And it's assume it would be impossible. Well, and we must assume Mr. Sizer knows exactly what he's doing. But let us continue this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, it was announced that one of the major Israeli airstrikes that took place this week in Iran killed an Iranian general, killed an Iranian military general attached to the Revolutionary Guards. It is not known if the Israelis specifically targeted a high-ranking military official of Iran, but it is confirmed that they did, this week in prophecy, manage to kill one. That is what has been taking place. Meanwhile, rumors continue to spread and speculations abound in Washington, New York, and in the Middle East concerning a new proposed peace plan by the Trump administration that will look to circumvent the Abbas regime and the Palestinian Authority. Jared Kushner's meetings, together with Mr. Greenblatt's meetings, saw a boycott, virtually, an American boycott of meeting with the henchmen of Mr. Abbas. Is the United States looking for an alternative to Abbas the way it once looked for an alternative to Yasser Arafat? Mr. Abbas was to be the alternative to Arafat. Now, it may be the Americans and the Israelis are looking for an alternative to him. Again, watch this space. This took place over this past week. We will be seeing what is going to happen. But do not be surprised if there is a new American initiative in which the Palestinian Authority and Mr. Abbas is not a major player. This is becoming possible because of the Ray Proshmal that exists, albeit in a low key manner, between Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the Gulf states. Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states are increasingly distancing themselves from the Palestinian Authority, as they are or have done from Hamas and Hezbollah. It is a changing scenario, and it would help explain why, why in a Gog and Magog description found in Ezekiel, that there are no Arab nations involved in the conflict. It's Iran, it's Turkey, it's Russia, etc., etc. Again, we have touched on these things at greater length in previous webcasts. This week in prophecy, however, we are definitely seeing things continue to materialize along these lines of a new American initiative. This week has not been a quiet one, but it is a week that has not seen all of the explosive activity of previous weeks. If there's one thing we have learned about watching the Middle East over a period of years, is to fasten your seatbelts when things seem to calm down. Things can change very quickly in the Middle East and do. When you see a lull in violence, when you see a lull in conflict, fasten your seatbelts. Somebody is planning something, and it will be coming relatively soon. 
The Americans may be planning a peace initiative, but we know that Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran certainly are not. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Jacob Prash. This has been This Week in Prophecy. Next week in Prophecy, we shall be coming to you from Israel. I should be there, and we will give you updated reports from where so many of these things are taking place once again. So please listen to us next week on This Week in Prophecy, where we will be coming to you from Israel. Thank you so much. God bless. Have a good week. Tell somebody about the Lord Jesus. He is coming soon. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you.